Sunday after Pentecost. So before you know it, I'll be saying this is the last Sunday of the church here. And I'll be saying this is the first Sunday in Advent. Things are moving quickly. Good to be here, gathered with you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I know Pat is back there excited. You're working on a fall season like myself. Yes. I'm very excited for that. Cooler temperatures and all the things we have to look forward to. Uh, we have a lot to look forward to this morning in worship. We have the opportunity to receive new members this morning. So Dan and Jim Crowder are here. Did he not put pictures of you guys? No, he don't get Okay. okay. Let's go. <laughs> so Dan, Dan and Jim Crowder are here, and, and the Fergusons are here. Craig and Kathy Ferguson. So a little bit later in the service, like uh, right after our first hand, we're going to uh, call you forward, and we're going to grill you with some really hard questions. But all the answers are in the bulletin. <laughs> so, you have all the answers to everything, and uh, we're very excited to welcome you and your families uh, this morning into membership. I'll do that just a little bit. Uh, a couple of other announcements for you. Um, some people have been asking me about Pastor Tim Norton and the Navajo Mission. There is a new website um, that we put together that gives you more information about what he's up to, what that um, ministry is up to in this time. That website is in the bulletin. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, so you can check that out. Very nice website. Um, we keep up to date with um, the missionaries we support. Uh, let's see here. Um, I've talked about new forms of prayer available. Uh, other announcements you can read about uh, at your leisure. And this morning, our divine service setting is three. Let's begin with our opening hymn. It's hymn 730. <laughs>
to heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you
God, whose strength is the neighbor and the unionist. Grant us humility and childlike faith, that we may glory to you, O will and be. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And taking him in his arms, 
He said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. So great to see you on this beautiful sunny morning. Wow, it's great to be back having our object lessons this morning. All right, so the story goes that an artist was busy in their shop and they made a beautiful tile. Something like that. Did you ever get a beautiful tile like that? It's an art, a beautiful artwork. They made a, a beautiful tile like this as a present for someone, and as they were and this guy, they were, they were walking, at, all of a sudden, accidentally, they dropped it, and it broke into pieces. And, of course, they were really upset. the artist was really upset about that, and the artist tries to put them back together. Sometimes things like that happen, right? All right, so here I had some pieces of, of a tile, well, kind of like a tile. You notice that was a square. You can see if you can put it back together. So, take all the pieces, there's seven different pieces, and you can arrange them so that they will make a perfect square, just like the square of this tile. So, yeah, so how do you do that? You gotta think about that, you gotta do all, all these type of things. Yeah, you know, do some thinking skills, big thinking skills. But, uh, things, sometimes things like that in life happen, where we have things that we come across that are, are confusing. So how, what do you do? So you have to use all seven of them. It's good if you just can't have one more square. You use all seven of the pieces. Put them all back together so it's one perfect square. 
So sometimes we have come across things that are confusing to us. We have some problems we have to figure out. Hmm, so how do we do that? Hmm, uh, so. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, in today's, today's gospel message, Jesus was talking to his disciples, talking to his disciples about his plan, about God's plan of salvation, that Jesus was going to have to die on the cross for our sins. And the disciples were having a hard time understanding that. They didn't, yeah, they didn't understand that at all. But then Jesus was explaining it to them. And as we know throughout, as we continue reading the scriptures, that the disciples, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through Jesus' his great teaching and power of the Holy Spirit, understood that message. All right, maybe I should show you right now. Yeah. Ready for this? All right. Okay. So thank you. How about we have our closing prayer? Because my open hands you repeat after me. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. And thank you for the gift of salvation. And thank you for the gift of salvation. Watch over me this week. Watch over me this week. And help me to be a witness for you. And help me to be a witness for you. In your name, Amen. In your name, Amen. All right, thank you.
in heaven, we give you great thanks that you welcome your children into your kingdom. You welcome we who are imperfect, broken, sinful. You invite each and every one of us to receive the things that Christ has won for us. Lord, this morning I ask that you would bless the words of my mouth, the meditations of each of our hearts, Lord. May it be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Who's the greatest? It's not me. No. <laughs> That's a question we want to know, though. It's a question we ask a lot. Who's the greatest? We all want to know. Who is the greatest? LeBron James or Michael Jordan? Michael Jordan? I don't know. Last night I heard Kobe up here, so that, that's another. It's hard. Who's the greatest quarterback of all time? All right. Oh, boy. Poor child. Yeah, no. No, no, no. Oh. Tom Brady. Yeah. And that, that hurts me to say. Yeah. No. Tom Brady is the best quarterback of all time. Somebody said, Dan, we're going to be Where's his green? <laughs> We want to know who the greatest is. The world is wondering it all the time. We are trying to decide right now who is the greatest in constructing a fantasy football team in our church league. <laughs> it's not me so far, Mr. Bleeger. How are you? Did you win last Okay. <laughs> the world wants to know who's the greatest at a certain sport. That's what the Olympic Games in Tokyo was trying to decide this year. Which country has the greatest competitors? Maybe that is the question. Well, uh, according to the medal count, America is the greatest, I'm proud to say. Greatness in the world looks to things like stats, looks to things like numbers, looks to achievements. Greatness in this world may also include things like subjective taste, like no way, I guess. <laughs> and experiences that we have in this world. For example, this 90s kid knows without a doubt that Michael Jackson is the greatest entertainer of all time, period. <laughs> Greatness is argued. It is the source of conversation. It is the source of much entertainment in all areas of this great wide world. You see, there is something in you, there is something in me, in all of us as human beings, that wants to know who is the greatest. Do you know that it was even that way among the disciples of Jesus Christ? Those first followers of Jesus, the same men and women who would for the first time be called Christians in Antioch, they were not free from thinking about, arguing about, greatness in this world. In our Gospel reading today, we find this fact highlighted. But what is bigger, what is greater than the human ideas of greatness is Christ's teaching about greatness. And Jesus taught his truth not only with his words, but also with his actions. In his ministry, Jesus set aside his authority to take on the role of a servant. So there is an answer to that question, who is the greatest of all time? It is Jesus. He is the greatest servant of all time. He is the greatest lover of man of all time. From the moment of his first breath in this world, which we saw the animals at the Timothy night, to his last painful, bloody breath, when he released his spirit on the cross, our Lord's earthly life and ministry, everywhere in between, was not one that we would consider fit for a king. Instead, every step of the way, we find that Jesus was a servant, not a servant to some, but a servant to all. Here is how our reading opens up today from Mark chapter 9, verse 30. They, that is the disciples, went on from there, where is there, that place where they were unable to cast out a demon from there the last week, and Jesus was able to. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching. 
teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and were afraid to ask him. A note to the reader here in the Gospel of Mark. This is now the third time that Jesus very plainly tells them what is going to happen to him in Jerusalem. About his suffering, about his painful death, and about his resurrection from the dead. Things in the Gospel are becoming more and more and more serious. Jesus is getting closer to the cross, to the extreme pain and suffering that was coming his way. And what has just happened previous to this story in the Gospel of Mark, previous to this, this demon that the disciples could not pass out, it was the Mount of Transfiguration. The place where Jesus took three of the elevated disciples, Peter, James, and John, up a mountain one day, and he says, you want to see greatness? Here's a peak. He gives them a peek for a brief moment into his authority, into his power, into his greatness, and it was too much for them. They passed out. Coming to, they go down the mountain and meet up with the disciples who are unable to cast out a demon. Jesus said, get out of that person. And you would think at this point in the story that the disciples would understand greatness. Well, Jesus is great and nothing else matters. We'd like to think that, but we'd be wrong. Verse 33 of our reading today. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. So just to be clear, after the Mount of Transfiguration, after Jesus cast out a demon that was too tough for the disciples, after Jesus tells them now for the third time what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem, on that same journey, the disciples had a quiet and inside argument about who was greatest amongst themselves. And that argument, to be clear, was something that the disciples knew was wrong. Because they kept silent and could not answer Jesus. And Jesus, the Lord of all, the hearer of thoughts, the seer of hearts, instead of blasting them with righteous anger, which is what I would have done, instead of letting them have it with all the holy indignation, the servant Jesus took time to teach them again. Jesus challenged the idea of greatness by teaching about the Father's will for his kingdom. Not just his own, but the Father's will for his kingdom. You will find it over and over and over in the Gospels that Jesus challenged the idea of greatness, about the idea of the world's idea of greatness, and supplanted it with God's idea. And over and over again, it flies in the face of what the world believes, flies in the face of what the world teaches, what the world knows. What is greatness according to Jesus? Well, he teaches it a couple of different ways. Here's how he teaches it this morning. Verse 35 of our reading. And he sat down, which is already weird. He should have been standing, they should have been sitting at his feet. But Jesus, all the time, he sat down and he called the twelve. And he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him. 
him who sent me. Jesus begins to teach the disciples again, because this is not the first argument they had about who's greatest amongst them. He begins by sitting down, turning his kingdom into bringing this kingdom into this world, turning this world upside down, and saying that the first, the greatest, is the servant, the servant of all. That what the world would consider to be weak, what the world would consider to be lowly, despised, is great in his kingdom. And looking around for an object lesson, he found one. He picks the lowliest, neediest, Greediest, least helpful, most taxing, snot nosed, grubby handed person you could find. Not a tax collector, not a Samaritan, not a Pharisee, not an outcast. He calls a child to his side. And not like a man child like we have today. Woman child, but a paeon, a little child. And Jesus takes this little child and he puts his arms around him. He holds him. And hugging this little boy in the midst of the people, he says, If you want to know greatness in the kingdom, you can observe what is happening right here. This child is important to me. This child is important to my father, and here is why. Your guy's idea of greatness, the world's idea of greatness, looks to what you think is impressive. And what you think is impressive is something or somebody that can benefit you. Somebody with power. Somebody with position. Somebody with money. Somebody with authority. But this child is a perfect example of what God finds impressive. He is needy. He is dependent in every sense. And he receives what I have to offer with open hands and a thankful heart. And Jesus says, Whoever receives somebody like this, like this little child, whoever looks to love, looks to encourage, to build up, and care for one such as this, that person receives not just this little, grubby-handed, snot-nosed child, not just this helpless dependent, but they receive me. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says, That which you do for the least of these, my brothers, is Christ. You're doing it for me. And Jesus says, If you receive me, you are not only receiving me, you are receiving my Father, your Father in heaven. You are receiving all that he has to offer through his Son, Jesus Christ. Greatness in Christ's kingdom does not have to do with stature among men, but status to Christ. And that's a hard lesson to learn for sinful human beings. Greatness in Christ's kingdom does not have to do with stature among men, but status to Christ. That status to Christ, that status in Christ, in fact brings us full circle into understanding who we are in regards to our Lord and Savior. The next chapter of Matthew, excuse me, Mark, Mark chapter 10, Jesus is going to use a little child as an object lesson once again. And it would be nice to think that the disciples would have at this point understood and taken this lesson to heart about what it means to be great in the kingdom, but it is it. In Matthew chapter 10, people bring lots of children to Jesus. And the disciples prevented them. They said, stop, get the little children away from him. But Jesus, this 
I'm clearly upset and in the spirit of teaching. It says this, verse 13, Mark chapter 10. <coughs> Let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Jesus says, if you won't let these little children come to me, you either are not of me or don't understand who you are to me. You see, anybody, any person, any sinful, broken person, which is every single one in this room, anybody coming to the kingdom of God is like a little child. It's not most. Rubbing hand, remember. Nothing to offer. Anybody who belongs to Christ and his kingdom is coming with nothing to offer. Anybody coming to Holy Communion comes with empty hands and a sinful heart. Nothing to offer. Anybody coming to the Lord in prayer is coming totally reliant on God's provision, on God's love. And Jesus says, that is not sad. That is not unfortunate. That is not weak. He says that is great. He said that when you are like that, you are great. And it is great because we are coming to the one who is great. The one who has first come to us and given us everything. The one who has called us to himself. So here's a good question. What would make a great church? I think a couple things would make a great church. A great church would be a church that receives all of God's good gifts and therefore gives because of it. A great church would be a church that recognizes that they have been so honored by Christ, so greatly honored by the Lord of all, that we would consider others more significant than ourselves. A great church would be those received into God's kingdom, into the eternal paradise and presence of God, and so marvel in that that we would receive others, even if we don't like them. That those who have been served by Christ, that we would serve one another. That we would make ourselves last. Because Christ has put us first. Through his life he has put us first. Through his service he has put us first. Through his love and through his care, through his death and through his resurrection, he has put each and every one of you first. The head of his banquet table, which we're told never has an end. In his kingdom. Amen. Amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. May it guard your hearts, guard your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Would you please stand and together we join in singing the opera?
O Lord of hosts, you oppose the proud and give grace to the humble. Help us by your spirit to submit ourselves to you and resist the devil that he would flee from us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. Lord of hosts, give our sins leaders, all pastors and teachers, the wisdom that comes from above, that they may be peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Let them sow among us in peace and grant a harvest of righteousness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of hosts, pacify our passions by your spirit, that we may not be ruled by the jealousy and selfish ambitions that give rise to disorder and every vile practice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of hosts, uphold this world in your order. Preserve the church in the preaching of your word against all enemies. Bless our homes, that parents and children may serve one another faithfully and grow instruction, grow in instruction and faith until life's end. Give health and wisdom to all who serve in public office, that their authority may be exercised for the benefit of our people. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, look with kindness on the sick and those who are in any kind of need. This day we ask that you would bless our brother Alan Ballard, uh, hospitalized, Lord, with an infection that's yet undetermined. We ask that you would uh, bless um, him with healing, that you would provide answers um, swiftly, Lord, um, and that you would bring him back to full health. Lord, continue prayers for our sister Maxine Benson after a recent hospital stay. She's recovering at home. We ask that you would bless her with healing and strength in this time. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would be with uh, the Denman and Halbert families this day as they mourn the passing of Donnie Denman, um, whose memorial service was yesterday, Lord. May they continue to look forward in hope, in comfort, and in peace to the resurrection that is found in Jesus Christ alone. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. O Lord of hosts, grant that what we ask from you may not be squandered after our passions, but sought rightly in faith, that we may receive them and put them to service for you and our neighbors. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, remember us in your kingdom. And teach us to pray. Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread.
today, and God's peace blesses your week. Thanks be to our God. I'll 